Hello, everyone. Um, this lecture is a combination of the facultative gram negative rods one and two. I'm combining these two lectures into one lecture, and hopefully, uh, in that way, um, two separate lectures. You won't be you won't be confused. Also, too, this lecture will be given on your exam the week you come back after spring break, okay? After this lecture, I'll be doing another recording for the aerobic gram negative rods, and that will be a combination of lectures 11 uh, and 12. So this is the facultative gram negative rods. Again, the um, enterobacteriaceae lecture will be a combination of lectures one, two, and three, and that will be given next week, the Friday before your um, your spring break, and I'll do a pretty good uh, comprehensive review the Thursday before your exam. Okay, so let's get started on facultative gram negative rods. Okay, so basically objective, you'll be able to identify and describe the clinically significant uh, facultative gram negative rods. Starting off with Vibrionaceae, the genus, um, the main genus is Vibrio. Um, Vibrio cholera and Vibrio parahemolyticus are the two main um, pathogens in this genus. I'm also going to be talking about Aeromonas. There's only one species involved, Aeromonas hydrophila, Plesiomonas, which is Plesiomonas shigalloides, and this used to be an Enterobacteriaceae. So Vibrio, Aeromonas, and Plesiomonas. Okay, I'm also going to talk about Pasteurella, cat scratch fever. Uh, Pasteurella multicida, and then Gardnerella, Gardnerella vaginalis. And then Campylobacter, Campylobacter species, there's three main ones, actually there's two main ones, Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter fetus, and then Campylobacter coli is another one that's very similar to Campylobacter uh, jejuni, and other Campylobacters, okay? I'm also going to be talking about uh, Haemophilus, there are several Haemophilus species involved, Haemophilus influenza, that's the main one. Haemophilus influenza biogroup Egyptius, and that's uh, another uh, biogroup species that causes um, pink eye. Uh, Parainfluenza is uh, a lesser pathogen than Haemophilus influenza. H. ducray, Haemophilus ducray, that's the sexually transmitted Haemophilus species. I'll talk about that later on. And then uh, finally, Haemophilus aphrophilus. And then there are other Haemophilus species that I'll also mention. And then Helicobacter. Helicobacter pylori is the main species, the only species I'll be talking about in this genus. And this organism is significant um, cause of uh, stomach ulcers, H. pylori. Okay, I'll talk about that later. Okay, so for the vibrios, biochemical tests, these are gram-negative rods, okay, gram-negative rods. And apart from enterobacteriaceae, it's oxidase positive. And then also, too, apart from, um, in comparison to enterobacteriaceae, the fl flagella are polar, meaning that, meaning that the flagella come out of one end, as opposed to peritrichus, where it's all over the body. You can use the bogues proskauer test, the decarboxylase test, and esculin test also to identify uh, this uh, group of organisms. Uh, biochemical tests, there's gas production. Um, you would see that on the TSI slant, fermentation of carbohydrates. Those two are not, um, they're important, but for Vibrio, not so much. The main thing to know about the Vibrio species, especially Vibrio cholera, because it causes such an uh, uh, important gastroenteritis is that it grows on TCBS. Make sure you know the media, TCBS, thiocitrate, thiosulfate citrate, bile salt sucrose, TCBS. You see those four letters, you think about Vibrio, okay? On blood auger, Vibrio is, is hemolytic. And then there's also the DNAs test. Vibrio is oxidase positive. Again, that's a distinction to the enterobacteriaceae, and it's indole positive. Okay. And like I mentioned in the previous slide, Vibrio are typically um, fl flagellated uh, on one end. So that's polar flagella. 
Vibrio species are found in seawater or brackish water. So what brackish water is, it's, the, it's where uh, fresh water, like for example, the Mississippi River um, flows down and it empties into the Gulf of Mexico. I believe it em empties into the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf of Mexico is salt water. So where fresh water and, and salt water mix right at that Delta, that's brackish waters. Okay, so it's in the brackish waters where Vibrio can be found. Eremonis species can be found in fresh salt or brackish and brackish waters. Okay, Vibrio is seawater or brackish waters. And Plesiomonas is fresh water. It's a freshwater pathogen. Vibrio cholera, like I mentioned earlier, it's the most common cause of gastroenteritis. So it's red, it's the most common. So a lot of things cause gastroenteritis, but Vibrio cholera, that organism is the most common cause of gastroenteritis. In enterobacteria, you, you've seen a lot of gastroenteritis with the dysentery the, and the bacillary dysentery um, uh, and gastroenteritis. A lot of them cause gastroenteritis, but Vibrio cholera is the most common cause of gastroenteritis. And you get it from eating contaminated uh, seafood or being exposed to contaminated water. And the way it enters the, the body is contact exposure, meaning, meaning that it comes through the skin, uh, open skin wounds or through the mucosa, like your nose or your mouth. So that's how it enters your body, it's contact exposure, and also the food and water that you drink. <clears throat> Verbial cholera, that's a typical shape there. Uh, comma shaped, it's curved. These are curved gram negative rods. And this is a, a this is not a gram stain, as you can tell. I can ask you if that's gram stain, and uh, it's not because um, because vibrio color is gram negative rods. Those are not pink. So what they've done was they've done is they modified the stain so that you could visibly see it. But if you look really close, if we zoomed in, you can see that these are curved gram negative rods. They're like commas or slight C shape, or they they kind of look like sausages. Okay, sausages when they're cooked. All right, so Vibrio cholera, you see sausages, that's Vibrio, that's, um, those are Vibrio species. <clears throat> Another disease that Vibrio cholera causes is Asian cholera or rice water stool. So that's a specific name for this, for the disease. Okay, so make sure you know that Asian cholera or rice water stool is caused by Vibrio cholera. Um, here you have watery stools, mucus flex. The mucus flex are, are the actual uh, cholera, and there's cholera toxin uh, involved in the, in the disease. And it causes hypersecretion in the GI tract. So this is a very bad gastroenteritis. Okay, you see the mucus flex. You see the watery stool, really watery stool, and uh, caused by the cholera toxin and hypersecretion in the GI tract. Okay. I don't know if those are bodies underneath those um, coverings, but anyway. Ruby cholera is halophilic. It likes halogens like sodium um, fluoride, sodium chloride. And uh, for typing of Vibrio cholera, it uses the O antigen. As you recall, the O antigen is the somatic antigen. It's the, it's the antigen on the body of the bacteria. All epidemic strains were assigned originally to serotype O subgroup one. So O1, um, that's the subgroup of Vibrio cholera, okay? Make sure you know that, serotype O1. There are more than 70 non-O1 strains that have been identified, but Vibrio cholera, just make sure you know that it's O1, not zero one. <clears throat> like I mentioned, the, the selective media for Vibrio cholera is TCBS. On TCBS agar, thiocitrate and bile salt, um, it's yellow. The colonies are yellow. And there's also another test uh, for Vibrio cholera, and that's the string test. So two unique identifying characteristics is growth on TCBS, yellow colonies, um, and the string test. The string test is when you take a suspension, like in the image down below, you take a um, make a suspension and then with your loop, you dip into the suspension and then you pull it up and it looks like you're pulling up string. So that's the string test. 
there's another string test that I'm going to uh, talk to you about, and that won't that won't be until we uh, talk about parasitology. Um, but this one is a, a string test for Vibrio cholera uh, suspension, colonies of suspension. There's two types, biotypes of Vibrio cholera. The first one is classical. And make sure you know this, the difference between classical Vibrio cholera and El Tor Vibrio cholera. Classical uh, Vibrio cholera is negative on chicken, red RBC agglutination, and negative folks proskauer. So the classical is negative for the chicken RBCs and negative for folks proskauer. The El Tor biotype of Vibrio cholera is positive for the RBC agglutination and positive for folks proskauer. So make sure you know that. Classical is negative for both. El Tor is positive for both. And make sure that you know that it's chicken RBC agglutination and Vogt's proskauer. Again, classical is negative for both tests and LTOR is positive for both tests. You will be asked, guaranteed, you will be asked this question on a test. So make sure you, you asterisk that for this slide. Laboratory characteristics, uh, O139 and O10 types produces the cholera toxin capable of epidemic and pandemic speed uh, spread. There are the, the curved rods. You can see that they're curved. You see rods like this. And, I, and uh, on, on the picture exams, like during uh, exam one, this could, be, this could be in a picture exam. And I could ask you, what, what do you see? What type of uh, organism are, uh, is in, in this image? And you can see that the rods are curved. This is Vibrio cholera, okay? The rods are curved, that's Vibrio cholera. The next species is Vibrio parahemolyticus. It's found in wound infections, septicemia, and the treatment because of the, the loss of water, the treatment is rehydration. You can all, Vibrio parahemolyticus can also uh, be obtained by um, consuming contaminated seafood, raw fish, or shellfish. Okay, so that's, you know, like I said, brackish waters where, where freshwater rivers meet, meet um, salt water or the ocean. That's usually like in a delta, um, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, where they have a lot of uh, seafood and shellfish industry over there. So eating contaminated seafood, raw fish, or shellfish is a way to get vibrio infection. And uh, the way to treat it is to rehydrate because of the excessive loss, excessive loss of water. Laboratory characteristics, like I said, brackish or salt water. For Vibrio parahemolyticus on TCBS, the colonies are green. Vibrio cholera on TCBS, the colonies are yellow, okay? Okay, the next organism, we're done with Vibrio. The next organism is uh, Aeromonas hydrophila. Uh, like I mentioned during the Enterobacteriaceae lecture, anything that's monas, Aeromonas, Plesiomonas, Pseudomonas, those are, um, oxidase positive organisms and they have polar flagella, okay? Aeromonas hydrophila causes gastroenteritis or di diarrhea and it causes bacteri bacteremia. Those are two of the main diseases that it causes. The laboratory uh, characteristics, uh, be as you can see from the name hydrophila, it's water loving. It likes fresh water, sewage, seawater, and it's recovered from tap water or chlorinated water. It's transmitted by ingestion, skin exposure, and inoculation. So all the, all the information I've given you so far on Aeromonas hydrophila, it's hard to pinpoint, well, what is it about this organism? Am I, am I supposed to know? What is it uh, that makes it unique compared to all the other non-fermenters? Well, uh, it's oxidase positive, okay? So a lot of organisms are oxidase positive, beta hemolytic, so are a lot of other organisms. This one, no growth on TCBS, that's interesting. So it's a non-fermenter, it's not Vibrio. The Vibrios will grow on TCBS <clears throat> and produce yellow or green colors, but Aeromonas uh, hydrophila will not. The thing about, and it's, I'm gonna bring this up later, is that Aeromonas hydrophila that you need to know is that um, Aeromonas, likes to grow on media that contains ampicillin. 
So make sure you know that all, it'll be coming up uh, later on in the lecture, but media containing ampicillin. It's really unusual because ampicillin is designed to kill or inhibit bacteria, correct? Well, this bacteria likes ampicillin. So, so associate A with A, Aromonas with ampicillin. That's a unique characteristic uh, specific for Aromonas hydrophila. Okay, Plesiomonas shigeloides is the next organism. <clears throat> Pathogenicity. And this is a unique um, piece of information that you need to know for testing purposes. Plesiomonas shigeloides is transmitted by reptiles, okay, like alligators and, and snakes and things like that. Um, you get it by ingesting contaminated water. But um, reptiles, reptiles is the main uh, animal that will transmit Plesiomonas shigeloides. So make sure you know reptiles. Laboratory characteristics, habitat is fresh, warm water. Uh, on culture, it's non-hemolytic. Uh, it's oxidase positive. Most of these uh, non-fermented gram-negative rods are H, uh, oxidase positive. They produce gas on TSI, so does E. coli, and it doesn't like to grow on TCBS. It does not grow on TCBS. Make sure you know that TCBS is selective for the vibrios. Okay, for identification, uh, the API 20NE, as opposed to the 20E, is, uh, is utilized. It's a not for non-fermenters, okay? The oxidase positive organisms are used to uh, are used on the API 20 NE, not Enterobacteriaceae. Uh, again, Vibrio cholera or the Vibrio species are oxidase positive organisms. Um, let me see. Let me bring up a few positive cultures. So you just need to to isolate it. You you can't you can't when if you live in the um, American Midwest, you can't just say, I think I have Vibrio cholera. You can't just say, well, let's, let's pull out some plates of TCBS. You have to use routine stool culture, like blood, blood um, <clears throat> chocolate McConkie, and then the S, uh, SS auger, the HE, the XLD, and then you have to rule out CIN, uh, Yersinia, with a CIN plate. <clears throat> so you use normal uh, procedures. Once you find out that it's oxidase positive, you take a look at the gram saying you see oxidase positive curved gram negative rods, then you can prob probably suspect the Brevio and then take it to a TCBS plate. Okay, oxidase positive curved gram negative rods, um, plate it to a TCBS plate. And that's subculture. But for normal uh, cultures, you use the normal procedures and plating media for a normal stool culture. Endemic areas for Brevio incorporate. Uh, and if you are in uh, an endemic area and you're highly suspicious like other cases of TCBS, then you can incorporate the TCBS auger. But if you don't know, if there's no incidence of um, vibrio isolation, then you still have to use the normal uh, stool culture techniques. Okay, endemic areas, meaning that there are cases, isolated cases in that geographical region of vibrio cholera infection then you can use the TCBS auger. Uh, routine use of TCBS is not recommended. Like what I said, you need to start off with a, root, uh, with a routine stool culture tech, uh, plates unless uh, you have known isolates of Vibrio cholera, okay? TCBS is for if you know, you, if you know you're pretty sure that you're gonna isolate Vibrio cholera. If Vibrio cholera is suspected, then what you'll plate it to is inoculate blood, inoculate McConkie, and then also to your TCBS. For isolation, uh, another um, technique, enhancement technique, is to use what's called alkaline, alkaline peptone water, APW, alkaline peptone, peptone water, which is pH 8.4. And you use this for enrichment. Vibrio likes that alkaline media and it's alkaline, alkaline peptone water. And then once you get it growing, then you subculture it from the APW and make sure you use TCBS. This is for highly suspicious if you think you have a Vibrio collar isolation. 
uh, as I mentioned, it's selected for Vibrio. Alkaline pH uses a bromthymol blue uh, indicator. Sucrose fermenter is yellow, that's your Vibrio color, and the non fermenter of sucrose is your Vibrio parahemolyticus. Both Vibrio species will grow on CCBS. Aromonas isolation. Blood, uh, blood auger uh, is made with, like I said, for aromonas, is made with ampicillin. It's selective. Ampicillin, um, aromonas likes, is uh, selective for ampicillin. It likes it. It improves the recovery from stool, which is, which is kind of weird because, like I said, ampicillin is used to either kill or inhibit bacteria. Aromonas loves ampicillin, okay? Uh, similar to Vibrio, alkaline peptone water can be used to en for enrichment. CN, CIN auger is also suitable for feces recovery. And then other media include McConkie and XLD for high recovery rate. But make sure you know, Aramonis likes a blood auger plate enriched with ampicillin. Okay, ampicillin Aramonis. For plesiomonas, the one that's found in reptiles, transmitted by reptiles, you isolate it on a sheep blood auger without ampicillin, okay? Maybe the ampicillin will kill it, right? But make sure there's no ampicillin present when you're uh, culturing for plesiomonas and it's readily isolated from the enteric augers, which is a, uh, the normal stool medium. Family, family Vibrionaceae for culture and ID. Transport media is called the carry blair, usually uh, for stool pathogens, enteric pathogens, bacteria, you use the carry blair, it's a semi-solid transport media. Um, and it needs uh, this special, this special uh, media if you wanna isolate it because Vibrio cholera is sensitive to drying, exposure to sunlight and acid pH. Vibrio, remember the alkaline peptone water it loves alkaline conditions. So acid pH will kill the organism. Uh, exposure to light will kill the organism. And uh, it's also susceptible. The, these organisms are also susceptible to drying. Culture techniques, uh, blood, blood auger plates ad is adequate enough for growing Vibrio. Uh, but you once you get it growing, you once you do the oxidase and you see that you have curved rag and negative rods, trend, you want to transfer your colonies and enhanced growth on a TCBS plate, okay? Even though it will grow well on brain heart infusion, that's BHI and blood iron plate, even if, uh, without the added salt. But TCBS is selective. That's, that's its um, favorite medium. TCBS is for Vibrio. <clears throat> for identification procedures, you perform the identification procedures the same as for other gram negative uh, pathogens like the salmonella and the shigellas, okay? The aromonas, again, uh, because it's a monad, M-O-N-A-S, it's oxidase test. These organisms, a lot of the organisms in the facultative gram negative rods are oxidase positive. Um, and you perform the indole test. Aromonas is also oxidase um, indole positive. So aromonas is oxidase and indole positive. Other tests, to identify uh, aromonas, it's DNA is positive, Volchikovskar positive, and mannitol positive, and negative ornithine decarboxylase. But those are, but those kind of but making you memorize these biochemicals. I think we're uh, getting into the weeds a little bit. Okay, that's why it's not red. Uh, for plesiomonas, remember plesiomonas, the reptiles, same culture and isolation techniques as Vibrio and aromonas. Uh, ampicillin containing selective media is not suitable. You don't want to use a uh, blood agar plate supplemented with ampicillin for plesiomonas. Like I said, you could possibly kill it. Plesiomonas is non hemolytic on sheep blood, uh, like it is for Vibrio. And those are the miscellaneous biochemicals. QC, you always want to use CLSI guidelines, Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute. And media, when you do your QC, you always want to look for signs of deterioration. If it's dry, you don't want to use dry media, or if there's cracks in the plates, or you never want to use expired media, okay? And is there activity? Make sure it's within, um, before the expiration date. Okay, the pasteurellas. Pasteurellas are oxidase positive, again, uh, 
in, in contrast to the enterobacteriaceae, catalase positive and indole positive. They produce acid by utilizing glucose, fructose, and, uh, and sucrose. Glucose, fructose, and sucrose. A pastoral infection is really easy to treat. Like for example, cat scratch fever. If you do have cats and then it scratches you and it doesn't heal and you go to the doctor and um, you tell the doctor, well, my cat scratched me, doesn't, it looks like it's infected. Very easy to treat. You just give the patient penicillin or a cephalosporin and uh, your infection will go away. Uh, similar to enterobacteriaceae, pastorella is nit reduces nitrate to nitrite, but it's not enterobacteriaceae because it's oxidase positive, okay? It's non-modal, it has no flagella, the small gram negative cocobacilli uh, or rods. And it also has, on, on right games of stain, it has bipolar staining and it remble, resembles a closed safety pin, just like your cinea. Bipolar safety pin on uh, staining, on right gimza, okay? Make sure you know that bipolar and safety skin, but then there's other organisms that do it. But for pastorella on staining resembles bipolar estate or safety pin. Another distinction from the enterobacteriaceae, um, all, the, all the gram negative rods of enterobacteriaceae will grow on McConkie. Pastorella species will not grow on McConkie. Okay, it's, it's weird because it's a gram negative rod. You think gram negative rod, take it to McConkie while well, nothing's growing because pastorella will not grow on McConkie. Like I mentioned, uh, you can get a cat pastorella infection from cat bites or scratches, and it causes cat scratch fever. You can also get um, infection from dog bites or soft tissue infections or bacteremia. But for testing purposes, know that cat scratches or cat bites will cause cat scratch fever. That's Pastorella multicida. Pastorella multicida causes cat scratch fever. It can cause, multicida can cause respiratory tract infections and infection due to past and current animal exposure. Okay, but cat scratch, remember that cat scratch, multicida. Uh, multicida will also grow on blood and chocolate, uh, will not grow on McConkie and it's in here inhibited by enteric media. So the, the enteric media, meaning like the Salmonella shigella, the XLD, the H&E, the CIN agar, those are your uh, enteric stool media. Pastorella multicida does not like those. It likes blood and chocolate, okay? It's oxidase, catalase, and indole positive. Pastorellas are oxidase, catalase, and indole positive, non-modal. It will produce acid by utilizing glucose, fructose, and sucrose. And like I said, you get you get a, a multicida infection from a cat scratch. Very easy to treat. Just uh, just give the patient penicillin. Uh, it's very susceptible to penicillin, and it will reduce nitrate to nitrite. Calling morphology. What does it look like? It's one to two millimeters. Typical is translucent. Smooth convex butyrases gam uh, and gamma hemolytic, no hemolysis. Um, it does have a distinct musty or mushroom odor, so it's red. This is red on my on my slide. Make sure you know this. I mean, musty or mushroom odor. No other organism will have a musty mushroom odor. That's Pastorella multicida. So make sure you know this. I'll go over this again during our review in a couple of weeks. The next organism is vagin Gardnerella vaginalis. Uh, this organism is part of the normal vaginal flora and it's associated with NSV, nonspecific vaginosis, nonspecific vaginosis. Ca can cause bacteremia, um, including neonates and postpartum endometriosis. These organisms are gram variable pleomorphic rods. They're cockabacilli. When I say pleomorphic, that means it has many, it has different shapes. It's either a rod or, uh, or coxy or cockabacilli, but it has different shapes. 
it's not all rods or it's not all coccybacilli, but it's it's a combination of both shapes. That's what pleomorphic means. Okay, pleomorphic means more than one more than one shape present. The one identifying characteristic for Gardnerella vaginalis, as you should know from your analysis, is that you see clue cells. It's diagnostic. The presence of clue cells alone. You report clue cells to the doctor. He's going to think Gardnerella vaginalis. And clue cells are epithelial cells covered. They're obliterated. It has to be obliterated uh, by small grain and negative rods, giving a gritty appearance. If it's like 10 colonies on epithelial cells, that doesn't count. Oh, excuse me. So um, if you see gritty uh, or very, very rough looking uh, epithelial cells, you have, you have clue cells. Okay. Also, too, Gardnerella vaginalis will give off an amine odor with KOH. It'll give, it will, it'll give off an amine odor, amine odor with KOH. So make sure you know that. The two um, uh, couple identifying characteristics are the presence of clue cells and an amine odor. And also, too, the must, uh, well, I'm sorry, that, this is for Pastorella. This one is the amine odor with K, uh, KOH. And pastorella gives off the must, musty mushroom odor. Okay, make sure you know your odors. These are not clue cells. Okay, so here you have bacteria around the epithelial cell. That doesn't count. See, it's not. It doesn't even. It's does. It's not obliterating the epithelial cell. Same down here. This is negative. You'll see this slide, and I'll ask you, is this a positive or negative? And because the epithelial cells are not obliterated, it's not totally covered with gram-negative rods, then it has to be a negative. As opposed to these positive slides, see how rough, rough these epithelial cells look? And down, especially down here, too, it looks like really rough. Well, that roughness is because the epithelial cell is obliterated with the organism. These are positive for clue cells. Okay, this one's negative again. It's not obliterated, but this one is a positive. So use this one for distinction. You'll see this on a picture exam. Gardnerella vaginalis. The reason, uh, one way to tell, well, that I can tell that is used to be Haemophilus because I haven't talked about Haemophilus yet. It's the gram negative coccobacilli because that's what Haemophilus is. Gardnerella vaginalis used to be called Haemophilus vaginalis. So um, that's based on its uh, the characteristics. So Gardnerella vaginalis used to be called Haemophilus vaginalis. Uh, it likes chocolate. Gardnerella likes chocolate and uh, doesn't like blood, you know, um, which is typical for Haemophilus. Usually the Haemophilus will grow on chocolate and it'll struggle to grow on blood, just like Gardnerella will. Punctate colonies are pinpoint colonies. Pinpoint colonies meaning that it's struggling to grow on blood. So it, it, it'll grow, but it, it'll barely grow. Um, beta, it's beta, hemolytic, beta hemolytic on human blood tween auger, HBIT. You grow it um, at 35 degrees uh, for two days in the, CO, in the CO2 conditions. Gardnerella is catalase and oxidase negative, which is unusual for the non fermenters. Um, Facultative GNRs because up to this point they've been oxidase positive. Gardnerella is oxidase negative, and that uh, makes it similar to Haemophilus. Haemophilus is oxidase negative. Okay, hyperate and starch hydrolysis positive. So Gardnerella is catalase and oxidase negative. Going back to Pastorella, um, the media is same for wound. When you if you're going to be culturing it, say for example, you get went into the doctor's office. Doctor wants to culture it. You just culture it on routine media, which includes sheep blood agar, chocolate, and McConkie. And then you perform the gram, gram stain off of the blood and chocolate, and you'll see small, gray, non-hemolytic organisms. Doesn't really um, react too much. It looks pretty non-pathogenic. Non A over A, TSA, you'll think it's E. coli, non-pathogenic. Lactose negative. Um, Maltose negative, TSI is A over A, and ODC positive. Campylobacter is oxidase positive. 
cytochrome oxidase. All Campylobacter species are oxidase positive. Uh, the catalase Campylobacter species are, are also positive. So Campylobacter is oxidase positive, catalase positive. There's three main species to know about Campylobacter. Campylobacter fetus, Campylobacter jejuni, and Campylobacter coli. Um, Campylobacter fetus will grow at 25 degrees centigrade, and Campylobacter jejuni will grow at, uh, and Campylobacter coli will grow at 42 degrees centigrade. So as you can see, 37 won't work. It's either gonna be 25 degrees room temperature or 42 degrees in a much warmer incubator, okay? 37 degrees will, um, will not work for Campylobacter jejuni, which is the main pathogen. All, all three are significant, but jejuni is the main pathogen. Make sure you know this slide. Naledixic acid, 30 micrograms. Campylobacter jejuni is susceptible to naledixic acid, and Campylobacter coli is susceptible to naledixic acid. And Campylobacter fetus is resistant to naledixic acid. Cephalothin, Campylobacter jejuni is resistant, uh, coli is resistant, and Lari is uh, resistant. Campylobacter fetus is susceptible to cephalothin, okay? On a test, you'll be given a table with uh, naledixic acid and cephalothin uh, in the columns, and then you, uh, I'll give you organisms on the right-hand side, and you're gonna have to tell me susceptible or resistant. I'm gonna try to put a table together for you to study, make it easier for you, but um, make sure you know the difference between jejuni and fetus. Uh, th those are the two main pathogens, jejuni and fetus. And I'll, and I'll give you a table for your review. Colony morphology. Uh, these are gray to pink colonies, uh, slightly mucoid, um, confluent growth. You'll see a tailing effect on the streak lines. That's the colony. The, on the gram stain, these organisms are difficult to see. They're gram negative and very pale staining, Campylobacter. Um, and these organisms, Campylobacter is pleomorphic. Again, pleomorphic, not all the same size, but similar shape. Um, they're not cockabacilli, they're, they're not coxy, but these are slender, spirally curved rods, okay? It's not, they're not spirochetes, but they're curved rods. Curved rods, I said, was Vibrio. These are not the same. These are spirally. Vibrio is thicker, like a sausage, okay, remember? But these are like, um, the description are gram negative is gram negative seagulls. So if you see gram negative seagulls, like a little M shape or spiral shape, and they're thin, uh, thin curved rods, that's Campylobacter. Forms an S, long spirals, or classic gull wing shape. Uh, when I was training, the the phrase was the term was gram negative seagulls. Okay, can be difficult to see. This obviously is not a, a gram a gram stain. They use probably, they probably only stained uh, this slide with crystal violet and then they stopped. That's a technique that, I, that uh, you can use. If you know and you swear that you've got organism in this certain blood culture or whatever, you go to the gram scene, you don't see anything, you can do this um, to make the organism visible where you just add crystal violet and um, don't decolorize it, just rinse it off. And this is what you'll see. You'll actually see the organism. It's a neat trick to use. I've actually used this uh, when I was on the bench. If I, had, if I knew there's organism there, but I just couldn't see it. Crystal violet only. Capillobacter is microaerophilic. Um, uh, it likes 5% O2, 10% CO2, and 85% nitrogen. It doesn't like increased CO2, just like the candle jar or a CO2 incubator. What Campylobacter needs is that they have these things called Campy Packs, where these are gas pouches that are commercially available. They're called Campy Packs, and it has the right amount of uh, oxygen and CO2 available for Campylobacter. And also to remember, you don't go cramp Campylobacter at 37 degrees. 25 degrees for fetus, and uh, 42 degrees for jejuni and coli. 
oxidase and catalase positive, as I mem uh, mentioned. On the wet mount, uh, this organism has darting or tumbling motility under phase contrast or dark field mic microscopy, darting or, mo or uh, tumbling motility. Okay, it's like it's like spring springs bouncing around. It's like springs bouncing around. Okay, that's what Campylobacter looks like on dark field microscopy. Campylobacter juni, like I said, is the main uh, pathogen causes gastroenteritis. It uh, the number of cases is actually more than Salmonella and Shigella. It causes uh, crampy abdominal pain, fever, chills, and bloody diarrhea. So it's it's uh, not a good organism to be infected with. Causes occasional bacteremia. It's focusing on gastroenteritis. Uh, many patients with Guillain Barre syndrome. Are, are infected prior to the onset of neurological symptoms. <laughs> Guillain-Barre symptom, uh, syndrome is a um, autoimmune disorder that can lead to um, it can lead to neurological problems. Guillain-Barre syndrome, and pa patients with tuberculosis will develop Guillain-Barre syndrome. Okay, I'll talk about that when I talk about um, uh, tuberculosis later on this semester. Campylobacter jejuni, where do you get it from? You get it from raw milk, uh, partially cooked poultry, contaminated water. Almost sounds like salmonella, okay? Almost sounds like salmonella, except that when you get your organism, salmonella is oxidase negative, uh, Campylobacter is oxidase positive. Self-limiting, it'll go away in about a week. The uh, symptoms will go away in a week. And if the symptoms become severe, then you can treat it with erythromycin oral. Uh, like I mentioned, incubation conditions, uh, jejuni and coli will grow at 42 degrees. Campylobacter fetus will grow at 25 degrees. And make sure you know the nalodextic acid and the cephalopin reactions. I'll give you, uh, I'll give you a table so you can uh, memorize and use for review. Campylobacter fetus, that's the one that grows at 25 degrees. It's not a common pathogen. It's infrequently isolated. However, if it is, it causes proctitis, proctitis or proctocolitis in homosexual men. So Campylobacter fetus will cause proctitis and proctocolitis in homosexual men. Uh, Campylobacter fetus will cause infections um, pre in, um, uh, in utero, for uh, uh, infant in utero, prematurely cause premature labor. It can cause neonatal sepsis and can result in septic abortion, similar to groupy strep. Groupy strep can cause a similar problem as well. Okay, so Campylobacter can cause obstetrical problems, premature labor, neonatal sepsis, and septic abortion. Um, on the veterinary side, Campylobacter fetus can cause infective abortion in cattle and sheep. Laboratory. Uh, characteristics of Campylobacter fetus, it will not grow at 42 degrees. So it's it's the other Campylobacters that are doing it. This grows at 25 degrees. And there's your nalodictic acid and cephalothin reaction. Make sure you know those, but I'll give you your review for, for those two antibiotics. Okay, pathogenicity. Campylobacter coli is similar and closely related to Campylobacter jejuni. So coli and jejuni go hand in hand because they're very, very similar. The causes diarrhea, causes enteritis in humans and UTI, UTI is rare. So it's very similar with the exception of hippurate hydrolysis. Other than that test, coli and jejuni are similar. So make sure if I ask you what other uh, Campylobacter species is similar to jejuni, the answer would be Campylobacter coli, okay? it's sometimes written as uh, a combination, C. jejuni and C. coli, all right? Um, morphology and gram stain jejuni also, uh, morphology also pertains to other Campylobacter species. The, on morphology on the gram stain, gram negative seagulls. Campylobacter, remember, they're gram negative seagulls. Selective media for Campylobacter is campy agar or campy blood, campy thiol, it, jejuni and coli require elevated temperature, 42 degrees. 
The CO2 incubator is not re recommended. Remember, when you're doing an incubation, trying to isolate Campylobacter, it needs the Campy pack. And that Campy pack has charcoal based selective media, CSM. So that's test, that's a testable uh, piece of information. CSM is charcoal based selective media, charcoal selective media. Okay, that's for Campylobacter. And you don't want to incubate in CO2. So CSM is Campylobacter. TCVS is Vibrio. Okay, make sure you know your medias. Media of choice. Campylobacter, um, when you have uh, Campylobacter culture, since fetus is not very common, then you're going to assume either Campylobacter jejuni or Campylobacter coli. So incubate your culture at 42 degrees. And when you read your plates, it's 24 hours, two days, and three days. So you, um, you keep your culture up to three days for a Campylobacter, okay? Campylobacter oxidase is positive. Pseudomonas is oxidase positive as well, but Pseudomonas aeruginosa also likes to grow at 42 degrees. So the way you can tell the difference, because oxidase, they're both oxidase positive, they both grow at 42 degrees, is that uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces a pigment. You look for pigment pr production, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa has the fruit juice odor. You've smelled that in the laboratory. So Pseudomonas has that fruit juicy odor. And then you perform the gram stain. That's another way you can tell the difference between Campylobacter and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas aeruginosa are gram negative rods. They're, they're pretty thick gram negative rods. They almost look like, like E. coli. It's that thick. However, in Campylobacter species, gram stain, as you recall, are gram negative seagulls, okay? Thin gram negative rods, spiral or curve. Uh, Campylobacter, you can perform the hippocrate hydrolysis test, and there's those two antibiotics, nalodixic acid and cephalotin. And performing quality control, you always want to use CLSI standards, CL CLSI guidelines and then your QC organisms has to be ATCC. All right, the next organism is Haemophilus. Haemophilus require, may or may not require two factors, X factor, which is hemin, and the V factor, which is NAD. So you got your X factor uh, and your V factor. It may require X factor only or V factor only, or require both X and V factor, okay? X is hemin, V is NAD, nic nicotine adenine dinucleotide. Hemophilus, um, you can use the ALA porphyrin test, we won't use, and serotyping, which we won't use. The most common serotype for hemophilus, uh, the most significant pathogen is the serotype B. That's the most common for hemophilus. Biotyping, you can use indole, urease, and ODC. But for biochemical testing, we're not going to use biochemical testing. So for identification purposes for hemophilus, we're going to use the X and V factors. Uh, more uh, identification techniques using carbohydrates, the so sucrose, fructose, ribose, xylose, and mannose. We're not going to be using those. Uh, organism, what does it look like? Hemophilus is our small pale staining gram negative cockobacilli or, or bacilli, and they're pleomorphic. Okay. Pleomorphic, like I mean, like I said, are different sizes and shape of the same organism. That's what pleomorphic means. Different sizes and shapes of the same organism. Uh, and these organisms are non-modal, no flagella. Gram negative cockabacilli, they're difficult to see. Hemophilus, uh, as the, the name implies, is blood loving. It likes, um, it likes the growth factors present in blood. It's fastidious. The, the term fastidious means it has special requirements. Okay. The most common type of, influ and this is in Hemophilus influenza now. The species influenza type B is the most common type. And if you have a hemophilus influenza, respiratory influenza caused by hemophilus, it's the most virulent type. Hemophilus influenza is the man, main bad guy for hemophilus. 
Uh, that's the vaccine that's given to children. Uh, this organism or this strain is uh, encapsulated and it, and it can cause meningitis, epiglottis, and pneumonia, cellulitis with bacteremia, septic arthritis, and also to pneumonia. So Haemophilus influenza type B is the most common and the most virulent, okay? It's not encapsulated and can cause upper respiratory infections, can cause ear infection, sinus infection, and lung infection, genital tract uh, and postpartum bacteremia, and it can cause neonatal septis with meningitis. Haemophilus influenza can cause neonatal septis with meningitis. Okay, it's, 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 a, it's a bad pathogen. Neonatal septis with meningitis. Haemophilus influenza biogroup, Egyptius, like I mentioned at the start of the lecture, there's a biogroup Egyptius, and that can cause purulent conjunctivitis or pink eye, or it can cause Brazilian purpuric fever. Make sure you know these two uh, diseases, pink eye or purulent conjunctivitis, or the Brazilian purpuric fever. Brazilian purpuric fever is Haemophilus aegyptius, Haemophilus influenza aegyptius, okay? Influ Haemophilus influenza is re resistant to penicillin. So if it's resistant to penicillin, penicillin doesn't bother, which means that doing the beta-lactamase test on this organism is really important. So because the organisms can produce beta-lactamase, if you isolate it, you need to do a susceptibility test. Okay, so the X and V requirements. Haemophilus influenza, make sure you know this for a test, requires both X factor and V factor. X factor and V factor, that's Haemophilus influenza. Lactose negative, mannose negative. But the main requirements are X and V factor positive. It needs both of them. The next organism is Haemophilus parainfluenza. It's less common, but can cause a wide variety of infections. This one is X factor negative, but it requires the B factor only. Influenza requires both. Parainfluenza requires V. Make sure you know that, okay? Haemophilus ducre, it's another species of uh, Haemophilus, causes chancroid. Chancroid is, is uh, an infection from on the genitals, sexually transmitted diseases, painful ulcerative genital lesions, uh, enlarged lymph node, inguinal lymph nodes, and satellite infection if left untreated. But this one is um, uh, sexually transmitted hemophilus, uh, STD, and cause genital lesions, enlarged inguinal lymph nodes, chancroid, and genital lesions. On culture, on gram stain, okay, here, this is a unique piece of information that you need to know for the test. On gram, direct gram stain smear, you will see school of fish, okay, you'll see a school of fish or railroad tracks. If you see the term school of fish on gram stain or railroad tracks on gram stain, that's Haemophilus ducre. Haemophilus ducre on staining, you will see school of fish or railroad tracks. Make sure you ask just this slide. Okay, X and V requirements. So Haemophilus ducre requires the X factor only, okay? The X factor only, V factor is negative. Haemophilus ducre will require the X factor only. And then finally, Haemophilus afropolis is a rare uh, cause of slow progressive subacute endocarditis, okay? Lactose and mannose positive. On the X and V factor requirement, Haemophilus afropolis is negative for X and V. It's, it is a Haemophilus species, but it's negative for X and V. Okay, so to summarize, influenza requires both X and V. Parahemophilus requires V only. Ducre requires X only. And afropolis is negative for X and V. Okay, make sure you know the X and V requirements. Haemophilus is also a member of the Hasek family. And the Hasek family, that's an acronym of the Haemophilus organisms, Aggregatobacter, Aggregatobacter, I'm not gonna talk about that one. Cardiobacterium, Echinella, and Kingella. These are 
fastidious gram-negative rods, these five organisms are fastidious gram-negative rods associated with infective endocarditis. The last two um, organisms, the E and the K, are Iconella carodens and Kingella kingae. I've actually seen these two uh, organisms on the bench. The Iconella carodens is an organism that's known for pitting. It'll actually pit into the auger. It'll, it'll um, corrode the auger and you'll have to dig into the auger, gouge into the auger to get to the colony. And it also smells like bleach. So that's Iconella carodens, causes pitting. Another organism that uh, causes pitting is the Kingella, Kingella kingae, uh, will also pit the auger. But between the two of them, the Iconella carodens is the one that smells like bleach. Okay, so you got some, some odors to, to know. And then the next one is Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori is the organism that is associated with peptic ulcer. It's found in the stomach. If you have a stomach ulcer or peptic ulcer, the organism causing that problem is Helicobacter pylori. If, if the GI doc wants, is doing um, uh, endoscopy and he wants to know if the patient has uh, an infection, he'll probably take a biopsy and send it to the laboratory. The quick test to identify whether or not the organism is the H. pylori is the urease test. Well, is the urease test because H. pylori is urease positive. It has the enzyme urease to break down urea. And that CLO test, when you do um, a urease test on a surgical specimen, is called the CLO test. CLO stands for Campylobacter like organism. It's a rapid urease test. So you'll get a piece of meat from surgery. You do a urease test. If it's positive, then that's a positive CLO test. You have H. pylori, okay? It's urease positive. And this organism is responsible for stomach ulcers, okay? It's, like I said, it's performed during endoscopy where a biopsy is um, taken and submitted to the laboratory. Hemophilus, like I said, the principle of identification is to identify their growth requ requirements, the X and V factors. Hemophilus likes chocolate auger. It likes chocolate auger. And the way chocolate auger is made is it's you take uh, lysed sheep red blood cells and gently heat it uh, 80 degrees centigrade. So you're, you're cooking sheep blood, sheep blood auger and that's how you get chocolate auger. No hemolytic determination. Um, blood auger is unsuitable for initial isolation. Okay, so you're doing your X and V tests. Media requirements, you can use triplicate soy auger or, um, and or muter Hinton auger, just like what you did with the Kirby Bowers. Presumptive diagnosis, you look at the gram thing, gram negative pacobacilli, growth only on chocolate auger. So when you're reading, because Haemophilus influenza is a respiratory culture, you get a sputum culture or bronch wash or whatever, a throat culture, you want a culture and you're not looking for group A strep, you take a look at your, you take a look at your blood auger plate and your chocolate plate at the same time. So what you do is you lift both plates up and you look at them. If you have, and because it's the same swab and the same specimen, Theoretically, you should get the same amount of growth on both blood and both chocolate, correct? But since Haemophilus likes chocolate better than blood, when you turn the plates over and read the two cultures, that's how you actually read respiratory cultures and turn them over at the same time. If there's more growth on a chocolate plate, then that means the additional growth that you're seeing that grows on chocolate and not growing on blood is possibly Haemophilus. So if you look at, if you see that the volume of colonies is more on the chocolate, then you look for those green gray colonies that's not seen on blood. Those gray colonies, you isolate and you gram stain it. And if you see the gram negative cockabacilli, then that's, those are, those colonies are possibly hemophilus. Okay. So you sub it for growth, sub it for isolation. Um, if you can get isolated colonies, and then the next day, once you get um, good colonies of Haemophilus on subculture, 
then you can use uh, those colonies to do your X and V, your X and V testing. Okay. So definitive diagnosis is based on isolation and identification from culture. Like I said, on chocolate auger, more growth will be seen on chocolate as compared to blood auger. And when you do your, um, when you make your prep, you suspend the organisms in saline. Uh, you don't really need to get 0 0.5 McFarland because you're not doing Kirby Bauer standards, uh, Kirby Bauer um, zone sizes. You're not measuring zone sizes. What you're doing, this is a qualitative test. We're looking to see if the organism requires the V factor or the X, fac X factor or the X and V factor together. There are three disks involved, X factor, uh, the X disk, the V disk, and uh, this that contains both X and V factors, okay? Like I said, it's, it's, um, it's a qualitative uh, test. We don't care if we over-inoculate, we're looking for growth, no growth, okay? So you match streak or streak for growth onto your TSA or your mueller hinton auger. And then you place your A, X and V strip, X and V discs on the auger uh, incubated 35 degrees or 37 degrees overnight in ambient air. It doesn't require CO2. And then you interpret the, the growth patterns the next day. This is uh, the V factor and this is the X factor. You'll get zones and where, it, where you see, um, if you see growth only between, this is uh, V only, this is X only. If you see growth only between here, then, um, then it's uh, Haemophilus influenza. If you only see growth around the X, then it's Haemophilus Dupre. You see growth around the V, then that is parainfluenza. Okay, make sure you know which ones uh, based on the X factor requirements. We're going to be doing this in laboratory. Uh, I think Daniela is she has one disc, but I need all three discs to do the tests interpretation. So here's your X and V strip. As you can see, there's growth around, you can barely, barely see it, around the, the X and V. And the reason why you see growth between the X and the V is because between these two strips is X and V. So the organism likes X and V. So it grows around the X and V and between the X and V. So this is Haemophilus influenza. Okay, I hope you can see that. If it's X only, then it would grow only around the X. If it's V requirement only, then you, you would grow around the V, okay? Hemophilus, uh, QC, CLSI standards. Uh, check your X and V factor dips. Make sure they are not expired. Uh, for QC, you can use ATCC organisms, um, not expired. Okay, so now we're gonna do a review. So name the genus that belong to the family Vibrionaceae, and the genus is Vibrio. What species, what species of Vibrio belong to the O1 Antisera, and that's Vibrio cholera. And explain how isolation of Vibrio is done in laboratories uh, of the American Midwest. Normally, you would do routine stool culture, but if it's endemic, then you possibly have uh, um, an endemic population that's infected with Vibrio cholera. So you can use TCBS if that's the case. And what test differentiates Aromonas from Enterobacteriaceae? And that's the oxidase test. Okay, and there are the answers. I'm gonna send this updated uh, lecture to you. So Vibrio is a genus, Vibrio cholera is the O1. TCBS is the isolation technique. And the test that differentiates uh, Aromonas from Interbacteriaceae is oxidase. Okay, is pastorella modal or non modal? It's non modal. Uh, what routine media will pastorella grow on? And that is chocolate uh, and blood. What common disease will Campylobacter jejuni cause? It causes gastroenteritis. And what organism is similar to Campylobacter jejuni, except that it's a hip rate negative? And that's Campylobacter coli. Okay, it is non-modal. It will grow on blood and chocolate and it causes gastroenteritis. Remember, it's the most common cause of gastroenteritis. 
Campylobacter jejuni. And what organism is similar to Campylobacter jejuni? And it's Campylobacter coli. Okay, what is the V factor? The V factor is NAD. And what type of Haemophilus influenza is considered the most virulent? And that's type B, as in Bravo. Sheet blood agar is sliced for growth factors at what temperature? How, so how do you cook sheep agar and how do you make it? The temperature is um, heating, slow heating at 80 degrees centigrade. And pasteurella and hemophilus grow, grow well on what media? And it's chocolate. Remember, blood and chocolate together, read it together, more growth on hemophilus. So hemophilus like chocolate. So does pasteurella. Um, routine culture that pasteurella likes are blood and chocolate. Okay, V factor is NAD, most virulent type is B. You cook sheep blood agar at 80 degrees centigrade and pasteurella and homophilus grow well on chocolate. Okay, and that's it for the facultative anaerobes. Again, this lecture is a combination of both lecture nine and 10, and you will, it'll be part of your exam on the Friday that you get back from uh, spring break. All right. Hopefully, if you have any questions, save it for the review. And like I said, I'm going to be do a, doing a pretty good comprehensive review the Thursday before your exam. Okay, so I'll be I'll be doing the, the next lecture, aerobic gram negative rods, um, one and two, in another separate lecture. All right, thank you.